two, one, two. Maranatha. Oh, it's noon. You're dragging your feet now, right? Well, we want to welcome everybody for our afternoon Q&A based off of the three presentations this morning. We want to welcome everybody that's watching online, Facebook, YouTube, and we want to thank you for being here and thank you for all the wonderful questions that have been coming. We're also going to take live questions. And so if you notice, the microphone stand is there. So I will just ask you, if you have a question, uh, stand there. You can ask your question and maybe one or two. And then once it goes down, then somebody else can stand because if not, we're going to have a long line. It's going to look like we're giving out free chicken. And so uh, oh I want to thank the speakers again for being here with us. And uh, are you ready? Yeah. Amen? Are you hungry? We'll try to make this quick. We'll try to make this quick. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Pastor, will you pray for us? Sure. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being here. I pray you bless us now. May Holy Spirit guide and direct our minds and our questions and our answers that we may learn from you, from each other. We pray in your name. Amen. 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 So again, if you have a question and you're here live, you want to make a question, remember, let's try to keep the question based on the topics, right? Tomorrow afternoon, we'll have a little bit more open Q&A session. Let's try to keep it on the topics and uh, go straight to the point, too, because we're trying to cover as many questions as have. We only have a limited amount of time. All right. I see the brother coming up to the mic. What's your name? Roper. Robert. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you, brother. Okay. My question is for David Chin. You mentioned things about the, the spirit, the evil spirits, demon possession. I know of someone who claims to have been healed at a Pentecostal healing. She had troubles with her knee, and now she apparently does not have any trouble. What are your thoughts on that? They're like speaking in tongues and praying over her and all that stuff. Charismatic experience. I, I was a Bible worker in Tulsa, Oklahoma for a number of, of months, and it's right in, you know, Oral Roberts University is there, and I actually got to visit the tower where he went up and prayed that he would die unless they donated millions of dollars. And uh, it, it was amazing in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the number of individuals that were into spiritualism. And I was at a, a, a funeral where um, the pastor was speaking, non Adventist Pentecostal pastor, and we, we happened to be at the funeral, and it, it hit this crescendo, and you could feel like almost this, I don't know what it was, but like this wave went through the, the audience, and then people started standing up and, you know, like kind of jolting and, and, and speaking in tongues. And it was like this very surreal experience. Um, the Bible is very clear that the the purpose of speaking in tongues is for gospel ministry, and if you look in the book of Acts, it was, it was a known language that they were speaking in, so the Bible doesn't support glossolalia and speaking in tongues. As far as the healings are concerned, I can't speak to this specific case, but in the book Great Controversy, uh, there is an indication that, she says in the quote that I read this morning, that the devil, when he impersonates Christ, is healing people of their diseases. And uh, I can't explain all the dynamics of what takes place there, but a miracle like that is not validation of the authenticity of their theological framework, if you're understanding me. So we can't, we can't use miracles as authentication of the doctrinal integrity of, of the proponents of whatever message that they're bringing out, because the Satan can impersonate, he can, he can perform signs and miracles as well, very powerful being. Uh, so we need to base our understanding not on miraculous phenomena that may or may not be taking place, but the veracity uh, of Scripture that is to be our foundation. Amen. And also sometimes the placebo effect, right? Yes. We heal yeah. our, our minds ourselves. So. Very good question, brother. Uh, sister, what's your name? My name's Noah. Noah, welcome. Uh, my question is to Adam. Uh, you said in your sermon that, uh, rightly so, that you can't, um, uh, you can't see the success of evangelism. You can't measure it with numbers and like statistics. 
Um, and from where I'm from in Israel, we had this one time where um, a group of like uh, Adventists, they went and they, uh, they wanted to like evangelize on Christmas. So they had like the whole Christmas tree and uh, sang carols and stuff, which in Israel, that doesn't work. It's like coming to them with like an outfit of a pope and like to scare them. So it, it's something that doesn't work. But then when I kind of asked them about that, they said that you don't know whose heart it touched. So my question is, is there such thing as a wrong way to evangelize? You asked me a yes or no question for a question that probably isn't a yes or no answer, right. though I'd probably lean towards a yes. There can be a wrong time and place and method in a particular place to do. Not necessarily commenting on that particular thing. Yeah, it's true that someone could do something that is not advisable and some heart may be touched. We can't, we can't discount how the Holy Spirit can work. Though, I think we should always, as I mentioned earlier, look at what's the target audience, where are we going, what are their uh, maybe natural prejudices that they have, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and, and try to pick a method or a means or an entering wedge that's best suited to that audience. And you should do that. And I think if you go into a place where they have a natural prejudice against Christmas or, or, or something like that to the majority of the population, then that just doesn't make any sense. Like, it's not about you, it's about them. And so, yeah, you can do evangelism in a way that just doesn't, it's, it's misjudged, ill-timed, and, and is, it can be even hurtful to the cause. I think about the, the book, Great Controversy, you've probably seen the, the maybe some of you have read the chapter, the, the I, don't know if, I forget which chapter it's in, the French protest, the placards where they, they printed out these placards against the, was it against the mass or against something, yeah. I forget exactly, and they posted them all over the country. And it, it did a huge damage to the Reformation in France, probably that they're still suffering from today. It wasn't just that, you know, someone posted on the king's door and da da da. Point is, maybe someone's heart was touched by it, but the majority of those, it was a huge own goal, as we'd say in soccer. So, yeah, I think we really need to take into a board where we go, who we're talking to, et cetera, et cetera. Amen. Before we get to the next live question, there's a question here from uh, somebody watching online, Sir Clifford. And it says, uh, Clifford, did God create the dinosaurs at the same time as the other animals listed in Genesis? Well, Scripture doesn't say. Hmm. All we have are a few very cryptic statements from Ellen White about this amalgamation of these ferocious beasts who didn't make it onto the ark. So, again, the issue is not the dinosaur bones are there. The dinosaurs existed. If you were to ask me, I don't believe God originally created the dinosaurs. I believe it was something that happened prior to the flood. But I am not going to be dogmatic about my answer. All right. Thank you very much. Yes, tell us your name. Hi, I'm Lisbon. I'm from Lens Church, Portland, Oregon. Okay, um, does science and the Bible complement each other? And can we use science to support the Bible? If yes, can you give me one example? If no, why not? Thank you. How to use science to support the Bible? Well, the mere fact that we exist. Where did everything come from? Not, I mean, the fact that we're here. I mean, again, unless you want to use the universe arose from absolutely nothing, the fact that we exist here implies a creator God. I mean, the, the miracle of life. I mean, if you really want to believe life arose by chance, billions, you know, and these chemicals somehow randomly created life and then created consciousness and created to be able to reproduce, you know, and all this stuff. I mean, I, I mean, if you want to believe that, you can, but just the mere fact that we're here and that life exists, the beauty of life, the complexity of life, I think it's overwhelming evidence. And you don't need science. The, but the more, I think if one were alive, 
Darwin had no concept of how, of how complicated a cell was. was. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I would almost, I mean, I'm speculating that if he had any idea how complicated a cell was, he might have just said, ah, my theory can't be true. Well, he actually said that. He actually said that if it could be proven, oh, yeah, well, that, yeah. It would, right? yeah. that if it could yeah. then gradually... Well, he, yeah, well, he had the idea of this, that, of, what do they call it, the, the complexity, if something could exist. Molecular oh, complexity. Yeah. I, I think Darwin today, irreducible complexity. He had another follow-up? He had his, uh, since you catch the implication that, uh, from the, that science is so opposed to the Bible, or the biblical views, so it's like a separate view from the Bible. So can we complement science and the Bible? Okay, so far, I've, I've only heard, oh, sorry. I've only heard that science is applicable, biblical views well, so far. So, science is opposed to, well, yeah. you know, there's been this story of the, the warfare hypothesis. And this has been the idea that science and the religion have always been at war. And a couple books were written in the previous century which pushed this hypothesis. And for the most part, it's not true. For the most part, science and religion have worked very much in harmony. But I will argue, though, that there is no question modern theory of origins today completely opposes any reasonable reading of scripture okay i mean i don't i don't care how and and, and i said this to atheistic evolutionists mock theistic evolutionists they mock these christians who say oh no because they know they know at the heart everything about their theory is completely anti-god anti-biblical but for the most part, most of history, there has not been a clash between a lot of the early, almost all the great scientists. All Christian. Yeah, were Christians. Galileo, Kepler, Newton. Newton, all of them worked believing that they were revealing, revealing God's working in nature. And the example, the rainbow. The rain, there's nothing about what science has revealed about the rainbow which pushes God out. If anything, it's like, wow, how does it that light bends and you get this beautiful, mag magnificent structure there. So anyway. Yeah, I think, I think what Clifford, one of the points, and I think this is a very important point for all of us, is that the problem is not the science right the problem is the interpretation yeah. of the scientific facts that are obtained through observation yeah. through experimental that's the issue it's the it's interpretation subjective human beings and i'm going to talk about this tomorrow working on assumptions philosophical assumptions not scientific assumptions philosophical assumptions that of necessity and you'll see tomorrow leads them to views about creation that cannot possibly be right. But I'll deal with that tomorrow. All right, I have another uh, online question. This is for Adam. Adam, this person is saying, I am scared to get involved in evangelism as a young person. What do you recommend to help I have courage? Undaunted courage. So they're afraid and they want to see, what would you recommend for them? Just do it. <laughs> I think David's got something in his mind he wants to share, but um, what do you recommend? I think what Clifford just said is, 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 there comes a point where you have to just do it. Walk in faith. Like, that f you, you, you can get more comfortable doing certain things. Like, for me, like, say, standing behind a camera. I can get more comfortable doing that as I do it more often, but there's always some fear or nervousness doing it. If you're a preacher, your first sermon was nerve-wracking, but you still get nervous when you, when you stand up. And Bible study, this, like, I'm not sure if you ever get over that. And I think sometimes people want to, I want to be free of fear before I do something. 
which is doing a lot of these things we, we say we do in spite of our fear. Amen. Otherwise, what is it? It's just a day-to-day -day action. I mean, the definition of courage to me, you're overcoming fear, and in spite of fear, you're going forward anyway. I remember when I used to call Porter or Canvas a literature evangelist, every day, you, 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 you dreaded the leader saying, can you get out of the van? Knowing full well that you're going to get out of the van that day, and, and, and you have to go and knock on the door. Oh, man, again, you know, I've got 10 weeks. You know, there was that fear every day, like, ah, oh, and then you get into it, and it gets easier. So there comes a point where you've just got to make a commitment. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go, whatever it is, and, 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 and step forward. And it may be that you're more comfortable in a certain area, but the best way to find that out is to do certain different things rather than decide where your comfortableness lies. So, All right. Your name? Hello, everyone. My name is Angel. I'm from Panama, and I want to start by saying thank you for these wonderful messages. Um, I wanted to also share my opinion on um, the question that my friend here asked before um, about scientists. Um, I believe a lot of the, I think part of the reason why a lot of scientists, one of the pillars of science is questioning, is asking questions, right? That, that's how it all starts, is stating a problem. Um, but a, part of the reason why a lot of scientists become atheists is because they are not humble enough, and I think they lack humility in the fact that we cannot find answers to everything, right? Um, now, however, I, in, in my experience with science, I have encountered scientists who are believers, who are Christians, um, and I personally don't think that science and religion necessarily are against each other. <clears throat> Both extremes are bad, right? None of the extremes is, 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 um, is uh, good. If you're an extremely religious person saying scientists are crazy, um, no. And if you're an extremely scientist person saying religious people are crazy, that is not the way it works. But I wanted to also say that um, regarding uh, the fact that we need more, um, by, I just mentioned this, we need more Christians and believers in the science field. So I do not agree with the fact or a little bit of the approach that you gave about how uh, maybe, I mean, demonizing science is not the way to go, I would say. Um, and questioning, I would encourage young people who are here today to c continue questioning and doing science. We need more scientists, more Christians in the science field. Um, and Amen. one of the things that, the question that I, that, that I originally wanted to ask regarding uh, your topic, uh, Brother Goldstein, um, is the word evolution is often misunderstood and I would say it, um, mistakenly defined. Uh, and is used, right, by a lot of scientists to explain the origin of life. But evolution, by natural selection, is not other but adaptation, right? Is the best genetics according, adapts to the environment. And we know the environment is constantly changing. Um, so when you say, for example, that evolution is totally wrong, um, it is wrong to explain the origin of a species, but it is not wrong to explain what is happening, the reality, right? Well, it's no one's going to deny. Thank Nobody you. Denies. Thank you, Angel. Yeah. Nobody denies what they call microevolution. Species do adapt, okay? Oh, There's yeah. no question. And see, what happened is, to me, it's a perfect example Thank you. of mistaking the part for the whole. Give you an example. Karl Marx saw, hey, there's no question. Economics plays a role in history, okay? So he builds a whole theory, this communist theory, all based on economics. Well, we all see how well that worked. And, you know, Darwin goes to the island, he sees species adapt, you know? And then the next thing you know, so there's some truth to it, but then it becomes, you know, I say that's, it's like, saying if the check engine light in my pickup truck comes on give it enough time and it'll evolve into a stealth bomber okay so they get a little bit of chill. no one's denying micro when I'm talking evolution and sometimes people play that game I mean billions of years of the, the whole thing that they use nobody denies the micro 
yeah. evolution. So, And I think what you're saying is that there's adaptation within the species. Evolution is teaching that the species yeah, turns oh, into another oh, species. Oh, oh, and it, that it, is, there's there, no evidence. There, there, it's such speculative. It, it, it's pure. Thank you. It's the modern creation myth built on speculation upon speculation upon speculation on and on and on Amen. and on so Amen. anyway all right thank you just a quick reminder please try to keep it short a question right because we want to get as many questions as possible through it brother what is your name it's daniel daniel yeah. we're from brooklyn i heard yeah i'm from brooklyn, brooklyn. bushwick bushwick oh I, I was born and raised in canarsie okay i know canarsie right all right all right cool. What's your question, brother? So it's for uh, uh, Adam. So I love what you said about wedge style ministry. So my question is, if let's say you have a YouTube channel that's not doing overtly Bible studies, uh, what are some interesting ways you can begin to slide in some things about, you know, talking about the Bible, talking about God in a way that might not be, you know, very up, up, like jumping at someone's face. What are some um, interesting strategies would you suggest? I personally have a channel that I do tutorials on and I want to start incorporating that in my content. Thank you. It could just be something at the end of the video, a short, um, you could be, you could weave something right at the end where you're talking directly about if you've got studies or some, you know, if you're interested in, da, da, da. but more, I think better is the weave maybe you could have a video or something that looks at some of the biblical print or some principles from the Bible that go along with what you're, you're doing, where you weave that in. I'm not, you know, some people have, I mean, I listened to a sermon last week that was by a chiropractor that was, he was talking about how he can find the three principles of chiropractor in the Bible, and he kind of made a sermon about it. Hey, his three principles were good. It was interesting. Anyway, the point is, are there a, is there a way, I'm not sure the content of your video, maybe we could talk more afterwards, but is there a way where you could weave something like a video on that, that would be more direct? Or you could have a little call to action at the end of your videos if you want to get more, uh, if you're interested in getting a study or something like this. And you know sometimes how a video fades out, you've got the, the credits and then something comes in after that? It could be that you put something right there. It could be in the description of the video as well. That's another way where you can start introducing in the description of the video, put a link there. Those are just a few of the ways. I mean, there's, there's no perfect answer, but yeah. All right, thanks. Yes, young girl, what's your name? Um, Abby. Hello, Abby. So uh, my question is, how do I bring someone to Christ that's had a best, bad history in churches? How do we bring somebody to Christ that? That's had a bad history in churches. So the person has had a bad history in church and you're trying to get them to come back to church. Okay. Anybody want to take a shot of that? David, you're, I see the mouse rolling around. <laughs> how do we help somebody that's had a bad experience in a church? How do we help them to come back? I would say you got to make a mm. distinction I'm a Seventh-day Adventist because of the Seventh-day Adventist doctrines. Seventh-day Adventists have almost nothing to do with it. <laughs> you know, you know, in other words, I learned a long time ago. You point them to Jesus. I know that sounds trite, but point them to Jesus. Let them look at Jesus' followers, how messed up they were, how messed up the church was. You know, all through history, the Christian church has been a mess. And I would just point them to Jesus and say, that's our model. That's who you have to fall in love with. People will disappoint you. So. Amen. Anybody else? Oftentimes, people who have been hurt, and this is, not, this is not the silver bullet that I was talking about earlier that will solve the problems, all the problems, but... A lot of times it's important for people to hear whether it's, and it rarely can come from the original source because if someone in particular, deacon so-and-so or elder so-and-so who said something hurtful or did something, maybe they've passed away or maybe they've moved on or maybe they don't even want to, but sometimes, and it's not all the time, but sometimes it is good and useful and people do find it healing to hear an apology on behalf of the church mm. or an apology on behalf of the way you saw God or Christianity. And it doesn't fix everything. It's not like the magic trick, but 
some people, it, it is important for them to hear those words, and even though they, they understand it, oftentimes it's the first time they've heard anyone from a faith community apologize for the way that they have been treated. Um, that can help, but ultimately I think it's about building relationships yourself with that person and showing to them through your life that not everyone's like what they saw before and that you can be different. Amen. Something that helps too is to, the parable of the wheat and the tear. Let them know that there are tares in the church. So in, annoy the tares and walk with the wheat, right? And so that's always good. And don't make it an, indica an indication of the character of God. Uh, there's a question for Pastor Shin. Pastor, the question is, how can I be filled with the Holy Spirit? The, the filling with the Holy Spirit is a term in the book of Acts related to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. It's the first time it appears in the book of Acts. It actually appears in the book of Luke where John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Bible uses the analogy, the agriculture analogy of, of rain to describe the falling of the Holy Spirit. And in the agricultural cycle, they would describe the early rain, which was the germination of the seed, help the seed to germinate. And then later on, they would have the latter rain, which would be right before the harvest, given that last boost, and then the harvest would come. And so the Bible uses this analogy of rain and the, the life cycle of the plant to describe our own Christian experience as well as, as, well as the church. Now, Jesus makes an interesting statement to the disciples in John chapter 14, where he says, the Holy Spirit is with you and will be in you. Future tense. So the Holy Spirit goes from a with position to an in position. And when you look at the sanctuary, there, there was in the holy place three articles of furniture, and one of them was the candlesticks. And every day, the high priest would come in and, and take oil and fill the lamps with oil. The priests represent Jesus, lamps represent us, the church, the oil represents the Holy Spirit. And the Bible indicates that we are to be renewed daily by the Holy Spirit while the outward man is degenerating, the inward man is being renewed every single day. And so we can receive a baptism of the Holy Spirit every single day. And that is a daily choice uh, to be filled with the Holy Spirit and that is the way that I believe that we prepare for the corporate outpouring uh, of the latter rain. So yes, you can be filled daily by your own consent and cooperation with the Holy Spirit and the sanctification process uh, with the Holy Spirit, and then you have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, um, the latter rain, which prepares us to give the loud cry before Jesus comes. So there's that daily preparation and then the, the corporate experience collective of being Amen. filled with the Amen. Holy Spirit. Hi, well, my name is Carolina. I am from Argentina, New Hampshire. I'm coming now. So my question is very quick, but I would like to, because now uh, this girl was asking a question, I would like to add a very little thing that I think that we have, uh, the church is like a hospital, you know, and we are all sinners and uh, we don't have, we need to, because we have many friends maybe that they left the church and it's very interesting important that we to understand that the church is a, a hospital and we are all sinners and we are going to the church to find our doctor Amen. the jesus and well so my question is i am you know now in this meeting i started to think about the dinosaurs <laughs> you know because many people ask the question so i want to know if you think that um, uh, to brother uh, clifford if you think that maybe it was a combination of you know a, a animal with another kind of animal that make the uh, the dinosaur because they were like created by God or maybe it was like a mix of animals made by the human being because the, the thing was very terrible at that time, you know? Okay. So like, if, for example, you put an elephant with a giraffe, I don't know, <laughs> you know, or something what that it become, you know? You okay, thank you. Yeah, well that's, yeah, you know, we have only this few very cryptic lines from Ellen White about that. That's what I believe. The Antediluvians did something prior to the flood, created these beasts. When the flood came, 
it wiped it out which and this is pure speculation on my part because you wonder how many did did they put the fish in the ark okay they didn't need to be there yeah right? and <laughs> i wonder you know alligators mm. man they are nasty nasty beasts man i it's funny i used to be a skydiver and there was one place where we were don't land over there because there's alligators over there and i was scared to death so i'm spec but i'm speculating here but i wonder if part of the amalgamation cuz i don't you really think god created alligators so again i really don't know but i i i see all around even after 6000 years of sin nature screams out at me just screams out to me not only of god's existence but of god's love i mean it's just uh, when the veil is torn from my eyes it's uh, uh, i could go crazy over looking at a grapefruit and i'm going to talk about that tomorrow so when i look at something like an the an alligator i think something's different there and perhaps that came from foot but the bottom line is i don't believe god created the dinosaur okay that's the bottom the line. next uh, in which yeah, book we only have is what ellen white said in their very short which statements book? i wish she would have fleshed them out more okay because there's some lot of controversy in those yeah. but that's the best we could do for now Thank, Thank you. you very sure. much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Long. I have two questions, one for Adam and one for Mr. Goldstein. Uh, for Mr. Uh, Goldstein, uh, when is the ship begin in regard to uh, theistic evolutions? Uh, why is the ship going that way uh, from the literal uh, creation to theistic evolutions? That's oh, the first question. Moving, why is the world moving that way? Why is the Christian world moving oh, toward oh, that direction? Well, it's easy. It's easy. How do, how do you think Sunday keeping came into the Christian church? It's because Christians are notorious compromisers. We want to be liked by the world. We want to be so the ancient Christian church wanted to be accepted by the pagan world so slowly but surely they started accepting pagan practices and voila we have the roman church and that whole thing and today christians want to be accepted by the world the world teaches evolution evolution comes under yeah. science and how dare some schmuck christian <laughs> not accept what science says and science says evolution so we better run and grab it and so on and so forth and that christians compromise that they do it since the beginning look ancient israel what do you think they were worshiping idols they were the whole problem with god's people from the beginning is compromise with the world and that's exactly what we're seeing today with evolution. I mean, evolu I can't think of a doctrine, a teaching more anti-biblical, anti-Christian in every facet than evolution. And yet Christians are falling out. You know the one that really disappoints me. You ever heard of William Lane Craig? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, he's brilliant. Yeah. He's brilliant. One of the best of and this poor schnook, he's now he's evolution. He, uh, yeah. He, oh yeah, he, oh he's going in there. He, he's buying into it. And he's the you know and on and on. And here's I would love, I would love to debate him on this. <laughs> of course, debate William Lane Craig. But mm. I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, but it's like, if you're a theistic, I would say to William Lane Craig, the only difference between you and Richard Dawkins, and Richard Dawkins is like the world's most, most famous, famous atheist. atheist. The only difference between William Lane Craig and Richard Dawkins, they got long ages, billions of years, death, predation, that whole thing, is that ridiculously William Lane Craig's got God involved in the process. Where Dawkins is smart enough to know you don't put God, what kind of, 
That's the way Satan would create, not God. So even William Lane Craig, which I'm shocked, wow. he's bought into it. Yeah. He's wow. bought into it. So the bottom line is, it's the way of the world, and Christians just fall over each other trying to follow after the world. And we got it at Adventism too. Don't kid yourself. Yep. Don't kid yourself. So anyway. And a second question for Adam. Uh, Adam, in your presentation, you mentioned about amazing vet have his name and also uh, Pastor Doug Bajal have his name. So it seemed that you need your company name brand mm -hmm. and your own name brand as well. Yeah, exactly. And can you say more about that and how to go about doing that? Thank you. Yeah, I did say that um, with Amazing Facts and Doug Batchelor. I, I haven't talked to them about their strategy, and I'm sure that played into it. If you're starting something yourself, it depends, though. I think it depends where you are on the scale. Doug Batchelor is not really comparable to many of us in terms of his name recognition and who knows him and whatnot. If I start a YouTube channel, Adam Ramden, then you know who, who's Adam Ramden? But so oh, I think come you, you've got to play some of those things into factor, and it depends if you if you're doing a YouTube channel that's about a particular thing, a particular interest, you would probably want to name it that because people may search for that. So uh, you've got to take it all in consideration and context as well. Um, I think if you are the leader of a large ministry or a large church or things like that, people do follow that person, so then it makes sense for, for that. Depending what your content is depends what you would, you would name it still, I think. All right. So this will be the last question. So if you want you three, you can write your names here. And if, Tomorrow. If, the, if, the Cliff, if the question is for Clifford, you can ask it tonight. If it's for the other two, then tomorrow I'll have you three first on the Q&A. All right? Uh, go ahead, brother. So my name is Tim. Uh, I'm a college student. And uh, my, professor, my geography professor recently said that, um, that the exodus didn't happen um, and that there's no, really, there's no real evidence for the exodus to ever ha have happened outside of scripture. So I didn't know that they were teaching that in public school, and I, and I tried to do some research, and the only thing I could come up with is that the, the Egyptians just didn't uh, record their losses, only their victories. So I just wonder if you guys had more information on that. Um, I just said to David, I don't know too much, not enough to sound intelligent. So um, <laughs> there is no archaeological evidence that I know of of the Israelites being in the Saudi Arabian desert. And some people use it as an argument to say, how could a million people have been there and there's nothing left behind? Uh, to me, if you, it's, if you go to that part of the world it's, and they were traveling people, they weren't, they weren't building whatever, they were living in tents. I don't consider that a, a strong argument that because they haven't found a shoe or a, the whatever in the wilderness that they're not there. In terms of archaeological evidence for the Exodus itself, I do believe that there is some evidence when you go searching un under certain of the Egyptian dynasties. I don't have it on the top of my head though. I did take a class in archaeology at Andrews and there is some, but I don't know what to go. I would say the absence of archaeological evidence mm -hmm. does not indicate that the event did not happen. Uh, we found probably a fraction, a micro fraction of, you know, but, but there is a statement by Dr. Gulick where he indicates that not one archaeological discovery has contradicted scripture. And, and so, uh, and it's gotten to the place where many archaeologists go out and they, they bring a map and a Bible because the Bible has been that reliable in terms of archaeological discoveries. You know, one way is, is if, you, if you believe in Jesus, you know, and you believe in God, one part of faith is believing that God is, you know, that he exists in character. And you can see from Jesus' own example on the walk to Emmaus that we talked about this morning, Jesus, beginning at Moses, and all the prophets. So, so Jesus pointed toward Moses and the writings of Mo Moses as authoritative and yeah. reliable. So that, that is one way of approaching 
the, your, your trust in the historicity of, of the account uh, of Moses. And now for the atheist, that's not going to do much. But for a personal belief, you say, hey, Jesus used the Old Testament beginning at Moses. Paul, in Acts chapter 28, had a Bible study with Moses and all the prophets. Um, you can see that the Bible writers stood on the authority of the writings of the Pentateuch as historically reliable. And so from a personal standpoint, look, if it's good enough for Jesus, good enough for Paul, Amen. it's good enough for me too. Amen. 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 All right. Well, we want to thank you, all three of you, for spending this extra time. We'll actually remember tonight we'll have Clifford at the uh, Afterglow, so he'll be taking questions there tonight also as he'll be presenting his testimony tonight with us. So I know that'll be a great treat for all of you. And so we're going to go now. We're going to have our lunch break, and we're going to come back at what time? Start trickling in 2.30. When you come in, you'll go to your left. You'll pick up your, your uh, outreach T-shirt. Hey. All right, you'll pick it up and then you'll come in here and me and Daniel will be here and we'll be giving out the literature and explaining a little bit of how we're going to do outreach. Remember, we're going to teach, we're going to teach you a very simple and basic method of doing outreach uh, that you'll be able to take back home and you'll be able to apply. And it just has to do with, hey, let's pray. Let's pray. All right. So let's, uh, let's stand up to have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Clifford, would you pray? Okay. Pray for us. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and I just thank you so much for thank you so much for the Adventist Church and for the message that you have entrusted with us. And, and I thank you that Jesus is at the center and the revelation of your character that we see in, all around, but mostly in the Jesus on the cross, and that the God who would do that suffer that in order to give us the hope of salvation. We can trust you in all things, even the hard things that come. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, guys. Uh, before you leave, Tony, you got anything to tell the kids? Tio Tonio? Yeah.